welcome all of you to Columbia Law School for the 2017 Federalist Society National Student Symposium. It is an honor, truly an honor, looking out at this room and seeing, uh, uh, wow, I, I, from what I can understand, more than 600 people registered for this, uh, this important convening. And it's truly an honor for Columbia to be able to host it for the first time since 2006. So uh, we welcome you all here. You are our honored guests. I'm particularly pleased uh, to welcome our distinguished panelists this evening and presenters, uh, especially members of the federal judiciary who are here and will be helping to uh, moderate discussions over the next two days. Uh, but I, um, and I am not in charge of the introduction of our panelists, uh, but I am really delighted that, uh, to welcome um, Judge Raji, uh, Professor Irene, Irina Mantor, uh, Manta, Professor Richard Epstein, uh, Professor Steve Call, and, and Jamil Jaffer, who um, I'll, I'll mention in just a moment uh, before I close my remarks. Uh, so many things that uh, a dean is asked to do when welcoming a group like this involve, uh, involves thanks. So I'll offer a few thanks, and then I'll offer a few words about the importance of the, of the symposium tonight. Uh, the Federalist Society, the National Federalist Society, has offered stalwart support to the activities of all of the chapters of the Federalist Society that are here tonight, and indeed, in order to help support this conference. Uh, we're right there behind us in, 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 uh, in supporting and helping us pull this off. Uh, Sullivan and Cromwell was a, um, was a generous sponsor. The Fund for American Studies was a generous sponsor. And um, I also want to recognize the tremendous and tireless efforts of Columbia's FEDSOC chapter for their organization and planning. We began a conversation more than a year ago um, about hosting this symposium, and they have been creative, they've been hardworking, they've been tireless, and um, I think that you will all uh, benefit from the fruits of their hard work to bring this, this convening together. So I, I want to actually um, honor and thank them as well. <laughs> the focus of this symposium, the First Amendment in contemporary society, um, I hardly need to say that this is a particularly timely and important issue. The uh, topic of the First Amendment is part of public affairs. It is uh, an exciting and vital time in our society right now, and issues around speech and First Amendment are, um, are really on the top of all our minds. The university is a special place. It's uh, a convener. Um, of the bar, the bench, government, scholars, students from across the nation, and it's a magnet for deep engagement uh, around the most difficult issues of our time and a place where we can, through our dialogue, uh, move forward in addressing the most difficult social problems. Uh, this convening will be no exception, having looked at the program and the topics that this group is going to be tackling, uh, both the people at the front of the room and all of you collectively through your questions, comments, and engagement outside of the panels. Uh, I, I um, am very, very excited about the, the force of the ideas that, that we're going to be moving forward here uh, during the course of these couple of days that we come together. So um, I'm very, very honored to be part of that, uh, of that as, uh, as the leader of Columbia Law School. I also want to say that Columbia is a place that in particular, not just the university, but is a place that in particular uh, takes the First Amendment and the study of the First Amendment very seriously. Our president, Lee Bollinger, is a leader in the, uh, as a scholar of the First Amendment, and we've very recently created the Knight First Amendment Institute, which is um, to be led by the director, Jamil Jaffer, who I mentioned that I would be coming back to. 
um, this new project is surely going to be the beginning of a continuing engagement here at Columbia with issues around the First Amendment. So uh, with that, I'll just close by once again welcoming all of you, telling you how grateful I am that we are here together to, to move forward this important conversation. And um, please enjoy the, the two days of this conference. Thank you so much. So I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of our first panel of the weekend, Judge Rena Raji of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Raji earned her BA from Wellesley College and her JD from Harvard Law School. Before joining the bench, Judge Raji worked at Cahill Gordon and served as interim U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. In 1987, she was appointed by President Reagan to a federal judgeship on the Eastern District of New York. And in 2002, she was appointed to the Second Circuit by President George W. Bush. So please join me in welcoming Judge Raji. Good evening. It is my pleasure this evening to chair the kickoff panel for this year's symposium on the First Amendment in contemporary society. The particular focus of this panel will be privacy and freedom of the press. I think I can assume that we all value privacy, never more so than when it's our own. Not so much when it's other people's privacy. There tends to be, in human nature, a curiosity, sometimes gentle, sometimes morbid, about what goes on in the lives of others. That keen observer of human nature, Jane Austen, wrote about this when she said, for what do we live but to make sport of our neighbors and to laugh at them in our turn, and to, for them to laugh at us in their turn? Well, now we come to the other side of our panel discussion tonight, not privacy, but the press. As all you law students know, for the framers, a free press was so integral to a free society that the First Amendment famously pronounces that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press. And yet, there's always some disquiet. We hear that the press is overstepping in every direction the obvious bounds of propriety and decency. Gossip is no longer the resource of the idle and of the vicious, but has become a trade which is pursued with industry as well as effrontery. That quote is not from this afternoon's White House press release. <laughs> it's from the seminal 1890 Warren Brandeis article on the right to privacy. Proof, I suppose, that the more things change, the more they remain the same. So, it's worth considering what constitutes a reasonable expectation of privacy. The right to be left alone, as Warren and Brandeis put it, in a world that these two men could never have imagined. One where card keys, card keys, record our every entry and departure from certain places. Electronic devices track our every internet search and cellular communication. Our financial and medical records are almost singularly electronic, and almost everyone we encounter on the street or in the subways or in any public place has the ability, often surreptitiously, to record our images, words, or actions and transmit them around the world. It's worth considering, too, what constitutes the press when a blogger in his pajamas may be reporting or commenting on the same subjects as the New York Times. To explore these privacy and press challenges, we have an outstanding panel indeed. Professor Richard A. Epstein, the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law and New York University School of, of the New York and of the New York University School of Law writes and teaches extensively on a range of legal subjects, 
from administrative law to antitrust, constitutional law to corporations, criminal law, environmental law, health law, labor law, <laughs> Roman law. <laughs> His prolific scholarship is just as wide ranging, with his newest book being The Classic Liberal Constitution, The Uncertain Quest for Limited Government. Professor Epstein, we're all so glad to have you join us tonight on this panel. Professor Irina DiManta is a professor of law at the Maurice Dean School of Law at Hofstra University and the founding director of Hofstra's Center for Intellectual Property Law. She teaches and writes extensively on intellectual property subjects, often examining the intersection between that area of law and social science. She is the author with colleagues of a casebook on the criminal law of intellectual property and information. Professor, welcome. Our next two panelists need no introduction at Columbia. Jamil Jaffer, as you've already heard, is the director of the Knight First Amendment Institute here at Columbia having previously served as the Deputy Legal Director of the American Civil Liberties Union. He created the ACLU's project on speech, privacy, and technology, and directed its litigation regarding the NCA surveillance programs disclosed by Edward Snowden. He has argued cases at all levels of the federal court system, including the Supreme Court. Professor, thank you for joining us. And finally, Steve Cole is the Dean and Henry R. Luce Professor of Journalism at Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. A staff writer and reporter, a foreign correspondent, senior editor, managing editor of the Washington Post, a writer now for the New Yorker, Dean Cole is the recipient of two Pulitzer Prizes among a host of journalism awards and honors we're so glad we have you tonight, Dean, to keep our feet on the ground. So how are we going to proceed? Each panelist is going to speak for about 10 or 15 minutes on a particular area of tonight's topic. I expect that will trigger further thoughts, even challenges among them that we'll pursue for a bit, and then we'll try to open the floor for some questions by all of you. So I'm going to start by asking Professor Epstein to share his thoughts on the topic and the extent to which changing times, technologies, require rethinking of legal principles. Thank you very much for having me here. And let me first begin by defining the term contemporary in a way which fits my intellectual predilection as somebody whose major academic interest is often in Roman law. Uh, when I came to Columbia College in 1960, uh, I took a course, one of the great courses that the college had to offer in contemporary civilization. And I think we started with Plato's Mino or something of that particular sort. And the basic conceit behind that particular course in uh, contemporary civilization is that great thoughts are always contemporary, and that what you really have to do to understand modern times is to understand how it was that the ancients perceived their particular problems, and then ask whether or not some changes in social circumstances would lead, as Judge Raji said, to some reconsideration of what's going on. Uh, the judge, unfortunately, stole my thunder uh, by <laughs> quoting uh, extensively from a passage in Warren and Ban Brandeis on the right to privacy. But let me see if I can elaborate a little bit more on why this article, which is universally lauded as one of the great achievements of Western civilization, is in fact nothing more than an intellectual mess. And <laughs> get you excited, huh? And the point about this article is it does what I like to call timeless history. It begins with the statement that protection of person and property has been something which we've always cared about from the beginning of time to the present. And then it announces in 1890, as you could have announced in 1790 or 1990 or 2016, uh, the vast change in social, economic, and political circumstances always require us to rethink uh, what is going on. After which what it does is then start to tell you something about the evolution of the law. It talks about the rise of trespass, the rise of assault, the rise of defamation, and then it starts to indicate that maybe we really have to think about the rise of privacy in connection with the freedom of the press. 
Uh, it is doing what I like to call sort of timeless history. Uh, there's not a single date there as to which particular document began or doctrine developed when or why. Everything is done in this grand magisterial fashion as if if you don't specify anything, you cannot be wrong because you're only speaking in universal truths. But if you then tried to figure out exactly what these period arguments are and how they developed, it's a much more difficult task to do it. And so what I'm going to do is to go back to my good Roman origins, as it were, and my medieval training and my early American training, and try to figure out if you didn't know anything about the right to privacy, as Brandeis and Warren wanted to put it, or what would be the way in which you would start to think about the kinds of protections that individuals would have. And then once you understand what the protections that individuals have with respect to privacy, pretty much everything that is going to be left over will in fact be protected under the freedom of action, of which the freedom of speech is, of course, one particular part. And when they start talking about, correctly, the universal protection of property uh, by certain kinds of individuals, and what they mean is that all sorts of individuals have some kind of perimeter or rights about them which other people are not allowed to enter. This is self-consciously a kind of libertarian notion in which the argument is that the a major duty of all individuals vis-a-vis all other individuals is to abstain from the use and the threat of force and to abstain from misrepresentations either to somebody, which would be common law fraud, or about somebody, which would turn out to be the law of defamation. And the law of defamation is much older than the law of privacy, uh, precisely because the concern uh, with the ability of one individual to detract from another person so that others will not associate or do business with them was very well understood in an age in which false statements about another individual could lead to their political demise or their execution or their murder. So defamation was well understood in very early times as a very serious offense, and so it could be tantamount to murder. Well, in this particular situation, we don't have a conception of privacy except to the extent that we have this perimeter around it. But then there is the other question about what happens if you have information about yourself and you want to share it with other individuals. Well, essentially, the correct response on this particular situation is that if I wish to share with the judge some personal tidbit about myself and I told her to keep it in confidence, uh, this would be a contractual <coughs> obligation on her part to do so. And unless there was some very powerful justification, uh, she would be engaged in some violation of this particular arrangement if she leaked the invitation to anybody else in this or in any other room. And so what happens is you then start to create these confidential arrangements, and it's important to understand just how enormously valuable they are, because essentially it permits gains from trade in the world of information. So the information you can share with your doctor, in effect, can allow for effective treatment. The information that you sell with one of your subcontractors allows that party to engage in the use of trade secrets for their mutual advantage of the two parties. And virtually every time you see this, you're fine. So the question you then have to ask is, if in fact you've got these two conceptions of privacy there, and then you play the same residual game, everything that's not in those two particular boxes turns out to be fair game, what happens is you've slightly rephrased the First Amendment to put back the words that Judge Raggi quite cleverly left out. It doesn't say Congress shall make no law respecting the freedom of the press, it's the freedom of speech or the press, and what you then start to do is to ask, well now how do we define the freedom of speech? And the kind of simple-minded answer that you give is that to the extent that there is no particular wrong as a common law nature with respect to what you're doing, you're allowed more or less to say everything that you want. And so what this then does is it gets us into a sort of a complicated question about how good were our friends Warren and Brandeis when they decided that the right of privacy had to go beyond the parameters that they stated. And when I said the thing was something of an intellectual mess, not only do I think they garbled up the history, but it turns out if you actually go and cheat the subsequent development of the law in this particular area, or what do you come up with it's essentially the entire edifice uh, that Warren and Brandeis put together about gossip and about small talk and about pettiness 
turns out to have gone the way of the Boston Brahmin. It is no longer accepted as a dominant mode of speech because it has, at least in modern constitutional terms, been swallowed by what we would call, and what certain deans might love, uh, known as the newsworthiness privilege, which is defined very broadly and very subjectively so that any time you find a tidbit of gossip about somebody else, which is in fact going to be of interest to some kind of a third party, this no longer turns out to be idle gossip. This turns out to be news which will allow you to shape and form public policy at the highest kind of level. Uh, so what happens is uh, you then have to ask yourself the following question. Is the newsworthiness privilege so strong that essentially what it does is to get rid of all the other kinds of protections within the traditional framework? And this, in fact, is a very important First Amendment issue. And I think for the most part, basically, whenever the press says that we are entitled to do something um, which falls within the two prohibitions that I've mentioned, one, the breach of confidentiality, and two, the law of defamation, almost invariably it is the press which is, in fact, overstepping its boundary lines, and something ought to be done to constrain it. Uh, so to give you but one illustration, when you take the New York Times against Sullivan, there's no question if you actually look at the particular facts of that particular case, having $500,000 in damages against the New York Times for what it didn't say about Bull Connor or about Mr. Sullivan is a bit of an excess, and there are thousands of ways within the law of defamation that one ought to be prepared to protect the press against that, the most obvious being general damages were wildly out of proportion to harm, and it wasn't clear that this was of and concerning the plaintiff. But when you then start to introduce the actual malice defense, requiring not the common law rule of strict liability subject to privilege, but in fact a different kind of rule which says you may defame somebody so long if there is a public figure, you do so without malice or recklessness of some sort or another, to my mind that turns out to be a mistake and that ironically when Judge Taft on the Sixth Circuit long before he went on the Supreme Court said that the appropriate accommodation was on false statements of fact, uh, there's a strict liability rule on statements of opinion, they're absolutely protected. How do we know which is which? Well, it's going to be an opinion if you give the baseline of facts from which others could make a judgment for or against. I always thought that that was in fact a better accommodation on the relationship of freedom of speech and the press to the law of defamation uh, than the Supreme Court started to use. And similarly, when it comes to the question of what one is entitled to do with information that was done confidentiality, it seems to me that the correct response is going to be twofold. One, if it turns out that you have an individual who receives something in confidence and they decide to leak it to the press, that this is in fact a very serious breach of confidence. And in my particular view, it is subject to an injunction not commonly accepted today on the grounds that if you're not supposed to do something, the best remedy that you can possibly have is to try to stuff the genie back into the bottle. Generally speaking, that's going to be of limited use, but nonetheless, in some cases, it may turn out to be valuable. And there is a vast difference in my mind between the censorship of a government of an unpopular position as opposed to a rule which requires somebody who has received something and under a matter of trust as a private right to ask them to control that trust. The modern view is a kind of a game of cat and mouse, is you can sue the party who leaked the information, but you can't put it back into the bottle or sue the person who published it. And if the intermediate turns out to be of limited means, uh, financially or beyond the jurisdiction otherwise, then in effect what happens is you're out of luck. It seems to me under the model that I put forward, um, this is in fact a mistake. And similarly, if somebody decides to eavesdrop, it's not only an invasion of privacy, but if they publish the information which they're not supposed to have, it's exactly another way of compounding the particular wrong. So just to finish up in about one minute, I guess, is what I have. Uh, what happens here is if you start looking at these kinds of arrangements and then ask the very simple proposition, what is it about the change in circumstances in modern society that upsets the kinds of relationships that I think follow from this sort of timeless application of basic common law principles, I'm very hard pressed to find anything of a substantive nature. I think it is clear that the velocity of harm that could be committed by the rapid transmission of information is greater now than it ever was before. I don't think that that changes the basic framework. I do think, ironically, it makes the case for injunctive relief in many cases stronger than it might have been in 1790, given the size of the harm. Uh, 
It may, in fact, change the rules with respect to the measure of damages, given the scope of the particular differences. But by and large, these are incremental changes that apply in every particular area. So I conclude on the note that I began with. If you really like contemporary civilization the way it was taught long ago at Columbia College, what you tend to do is to resist the temptation for novelty and support what I called in a paper I wrote some years ago, the static conception of the common law, on the grounds that it says a first approximation are more appropriate for what you want to do than a lot of the modern razzmatazz that passes for great scholarship on the part of academics and occasionally present company excluded judges. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Now that we've gotten the big picture view about some of these topics, we're going to consider the tension between the regulatory approach and the more flexible common law type approach to resolving the societal problems that we confront. And for that, we're going to turn now to Professor Manta. Thank you so much. And I want to thank the Federalist Society and everybody at Columbia Law School for having me. It's a great honor. And I also feel like things are coming full circle because I was actually here in 2006 uh, as a 3L attending. So it's, uh, it's very nice to be back in this capacity. I, uh, I want to start off by talking a bit about a framework that I think will help us address some of these questions of whether we need new regulations, as some have proposed, to uh, deal with the rapidly accelerating world of, uh, of spreading news. And, and that framework uh, deals with the issue of incommensurability. So we have different values. We have privacy, and then in some contexts we have national security and free speech. And at the end of the day, those things are just words. And they're apples and oranges. It's very hard to have a conversation with somebody about, hey, you want some more national security or do you want some more privacy, right? Uh, and uh, especially in our value pluralistic society, which you need uh, no further evidence than the most recent election to recognize just how pluralistic, um, it becomes very difficult to engage in dialogue. So let's say you're talking to somebody who disagrees with you on, on these kinds of values and how much we should care about each. And you're talking and talking and talking over maybe even years, and you iron out the logical inconsistencies in each other's arguments, and at the end of the day you discover that you just have different moral assumptions. And there are different values uh, that you think should be front and center. And at that point you can't really talk anymore. You're done. So what I propose uh, in my framework, and I talk more about this in a paper called Choosing Privacy, you can check it out on SSRN if you want the, the details of all this, um, is that we should actually value the, uh, we should pick the value of choice, of individual choice as the central one to measure. And that when we engage in cost-benefit analysis, when we look at new regulations or existing regulations, that is what we should choose. Well, all right, why choice? It is essentially the most agnostic uh, of all values. It is the one that, yes, also relies on some assumptions, uh, but on, on ultimately the fewest moral assumptions. And that allows people to uh, sort of live and let live and coexist as best as possible. If we agree with that framework, we can now take that and, and uh, look at how that plays out and how that has played out historically in the context of privacy versus uh, other forms of speech. And it turns out that even though the world has changed and the new technologies have, have changed the landscape and, and kind of the bad things that you might be able to do to somebody by uh, spreading uh, negative information about them, it's really been more of an up and down over the years uh, than, than sort of a steady decline of privacy. So if, if you think about the good old days when everybody was living in the village and they couldn't really move anywhere, they were sort of stuck there, if something bad happened, if a person did something bad, they didn't have the choice to say, oh, well, I want the, the right to be forgotten, right? Like we have in, in Europe now where you can ask Google at some point to uh, delete things about you. No, people remembered and they remembered things for a really long time. And the right to privacy did not mean that you had the right to be liked by everybody. And so we, we have to be careful to, to draw a distinction there. And it's only with modern urbanization that things became more anonymous and that the landscape of choice changed. So there were certain choices that you had in the village, right? You could choose to engage in bad behavior, but then uh, other people also could choose to ostracize you as a result of your behavior. In the big city, that's not so simple anymore, 
right? Now people might engage in some negative behaviors that can stay hidden, they have greater privacy, but that means other people have fewer choices. So when they engage, in them, uh, engage with these people, they don't have information about them and might be misled about certain things. Now, how does this play out in the context of uh, news gathering uh, sites, um, news producing sites like Gawker? And I also want, will mention uh, information gathering sites where the, the production of the news uh, is really done by individuals and, and a site is only taking the content but not uh, adding its own writing or anything like that. The big case uh, that has come up in the uh, news production business has been the one of uh, the, the Hulk Hogan sex tape. Many of you may have heard about this case where Gawker uh, publicized an excerpt, a 30 second excerpt from about a half hour uh, sex tape where Hulk Hogan was engaging in an extramarital affair with uh, his best friend's wife. Uh, when this was allegedly done with the best friend's uh, consent and that's also the person that did the filming and then this was disclosed. Now, this is one case where the newsworthiness doctrine had to be uh, applied, and the trial court ended up deciding that, indeed, uh, Hulk Hogan had been harmed, that this was not newsworthy, and awarded $140 million. Many experts and, uh, and scholars think this would not have actually held up on appeal, uh, but we're not going to find out because, as with so many things, the case settled uh, and, and for a much, uh, much lesser amount, but still a lot of money. And this really ended up tanking Gawker. So when we think about uh, these kinds of sites, and again, what choices do people have and the choices that they have in producing news and in receiving that kind of news, the law that we currently have was already enough even though, again, it's questionable whether it was applied correctly, but was already enough to tank that site. So now imagine additional regulations uh, and, and what kind of impact they would have. So this is an example of, of a case that, frankly, I think could have gone either way under the newsworthiness doctrine. Uh, on the one hand, you can imagine a scenario in which Hulk Hogan has sex with his wife at home, and that would clearly not be newsworthy. Or you can imagine a scenario where Hulk Hogan has sex on Times Square with a prostitute, and there are images of that, and then that is, that is fairly clearly newsworthy. And this case lives somewhere in the middle between those two, and reasonable minds might differ on uh, whether it's newsworthy or not. How might that be newsworthy beyond sort of rubbernecking? Well, some people look up to Hulk Hogan, and their children look up to Hulk Hogan, and this is information that might seem strange to you, but if you grew up in the, in the 80s and 90s, it wouldn't seem as strange. Uh, and, so, and so this is information that to some people is actually valuable and is newsworthy. Uh, and, and, and it's not so clear that, that we need additional, again, it's not a right to, to not be disliked. Uh, and, and so it's not so clear that additional regulations would help here. And what would a regulation even look like? We could have a regulation that says if you're a new site, you can never disclose sexually explicit materials. But as I said, this would come at a loss to choice in the way that I just explained. And to take a more extreme case, you could imagine, let's say, a very conservative politician uh, that has been speaking out against uh, homosexual rights, getting caught having sex, having homosexual sex at a public airport, right? Um, and and that, there's a sex tape of that, and that would clearly be newsworthy. Now, do we want to say that this kind of material should be excluded altogether? So I think, I think that what we are trying to do is superimpose uh, rules where really only standards work. The cases are messy because they have to be messy. The newsworthiness doctrine is messy and I'm sure frustrating to, to many students because it really is the kind of situation where it depends uh, and, and where there are a lot of uh, costs potentially on both sides depending on how we rule. I want to say a couple of words also about sites that aggregate information as opposed to producing it themselves. There you might think that the case should be much clearer there. So you have websites like reportmyex.com, right, where people can say things, including defamatory things, uh, about uh, what their ex did to them, and, and they did horrible things, and they may have cheated, and all that stuff. You might say, well, this is horrible as far as privacy is concerned, right? Like it's, you know, somebody might have a hard time uh, defending himself, et cetera. But, but. We do have the ability uh, to, to have people go to court over the original person that, um, against the original person that made the statement. So we do have laws that address that and that try to provide incentives against it. And, and we have to think about, all right, what does the world look like on the other side, right? So 
imagine, again, urban centers, uh, people are dealing with people they don't necessarily know. We live in the age of Tinder. Uh, and so in that context, this might, be, this might give some people the ability to choose to not engage with certain kinds of individuals. So you want to make regulations where aggregators are punished more harshly, not just, again, not just producers of news, but aggregators of information. There is also going to be a loss to choice. So there are, there are different ways that one might come out uh, on you know, wh where, wh where uh, there are likely to be more choices or what the quality of the choices might be that we have on, on any one side. Um, but I do want to emphasize that this is about more than just scandal. This is about more than just people uh, wanting, being curious about the lives of others uh, and, and wanting to be intrusive in that way. And so the way that I come out on this question of uh, regulations is that Instead of trying to have new regulations, we should stick with the common law uh, as we've had so far and, and the framework we've had so far because it allows us much more flexibility in dealing with these matters. So with that, I'm gonna let the next speaker go. Thank you. I have to say that um, having a little difficulty conceiving of the framers like Madison and Hamilton discussing whether or not sex tapes should be covered by the First <laughs> Amendment. Can't quite, can't quite get that picture. Um, I, but I, I am sure they're familiar, they were very familiar with the term vulgar. Um, <laughs> Prof. Mr. Jaffer, you've considered the expanding role of government surveillance, which as I suggest in my remarks goes hand in hand with expanding private surveillance too, and how the courts have tried to delineate, enforce, limit um, all of this. So could you please share with us some of your thoughts about that? Sure. Uh, first, I was one of those people who looked up to Hulk Hogan. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, well, th thanks for the invitation to, to, to speak. I I'm going to get um, a little more detailed about uh, national security surveillance in particular. And I want to make three, uh, three points. I just don't have a sense of how controversial these points are. Maybe they're not controversial at all, and they're, they're, um, uh, or maybe they are. We'll find out. Uh, one is just that the government's surveillance authority, its, it's um, uh, surveillance authority has expanded dramatically over the last 20 years. Uh, the second point is that uh, collectively we have uh, only started to grapple with the implications of that surveillance um, for the freedoms of speech and association uh, and the press. And the third is that um, uh, the courts, which you might have expected to play a role, a significant role, in um, in setting out the, the proper scope and limits of government surveillance authority uh, have, have not played that role. So let me make those three points, or just talk a little bit about those three points, and then I'll end with a few quick observations about the, the surveillance debate that we're likely to have over the next, um, the next 10 months, um, because the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendments Act of 2008 is scheduled to sunset at the end of this year. So, so first, just some, some important milestones about uh, relating to national security surveillance over the last um, 17 years. First, the, 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 the Patriot Act of, 2000, of 2001, passed right in, in the weeks after the 9-11 attacks. Um, one of the things that the Patriot Act did was uh, remove the individualized suspicion requirement from national security letter authority. So national security letters, as you may or may not know, are uh, instruments that uh, executive branch agencies can use to demand the disclosure of certain kinds of information, um, financial information, credit information, um, and then information relating to internet activity as well. And it used to be that there was an individualized suspicion requirement which limited uh, the, the uh, opportunities for, for use of the, the authority. But Congress removed that uh, requirement and replaced it with a relevance requirement, which meant that the FBI, for example, could use this power to get information about anyone so long as they believed that the information was relevant to an ongoing investigation. And unsurprisingly, that had a pretty dramatic effect on the um, uh, the frequency with which the, the FBI used that power. In the years before 9-11, they would serve 
a handful of these national security letters every year. In recent years, it's been tens of thousands every year. Uh, in 2013, for example, it served, the FBI served more than 14,000 national security letters for information about U.S. persons, uh, meaning U.S. citizens or residents, and tens of thousands more uh, for people who weren't U.S. persons. So that's a pretty, you know, to me that seems like a very large number. The theory of that surveillance, uh, and this is something that the Justice Department has said in, in, in congressional testimony, uh, is that you can't connect the dots unless you first collect the dots, um, which has a certain logic to it, uh, but also has, um, I think, fairly obvious implications for individual, for individual rights. It was on the basis of those same amendments, those 2001 amendments, that the National Security Agency launched the call records program that, uh, that Edward Snowden disclosed in 2013. Uh, and as you all know, that program involved the NSA keeping track, making a record of every phone call made, or virtually every phone call made, on a domestic telephone network. Uh, who picked up the phone, who they called, how long they spoke for, when they spoke to them. Uh, all of that was recorded in a government database, uh, and various federal agencies could query the database uh, initially without the involvement of, uh, of the judiciary. Um, in, in 2005, the New York Times exposed the warrantless wiretapping program that the Bush administration had authorized. Um, that program involved um, the monitoring of one-end domestic phone calls, so one-end international, one-end domestic, uh, where one party to the phone call was suspected to be a foreign agent or a, a, a terrorist. And, and that program was regarded initially, I think, as a, as a scandal. Um, but in 2008, Congress passed a law called the FISA Amendments Act, the same one I referenced earlier, uh, which essentially ratified what the Bush administration had been doing and in fact expanded the government's authority, the authority of the National Security Agency in particular, uh, to uh, engage in surveillance of uh, international, again, one end domestic uh, communications. One, one of the things we learned from the Snowden disclosures was that, was that those, those uh, authorities that Congress granted in 2008 have been implemented uh, in a very broad way, perhaps you know, unsurprisingly. I think, I think it is unsurprising that when national security agencies are given this kind of power, um, they feel the obligation to implement the authorities in, uh, in a broad way, because if, um, you know, if, if, if there's a, a terrorist attack and somebody says, um, you know, somebody says, uh, why didn't you use all the authority we gave you, whatever their reasons are, even if they're good reasons, are going to sound like not very good reasons at that particular moment. So the instinct, uh, which is an un understandable one, is to use the power that you're granted. And the Snowden disclosures, I think, make pretty clear that they've used at least the power that they were granted. Um, the, the, the call records uh, program, which I mentioned, is one example. But um, under the FISA Amendments Act, the, the NSA has said that it targeted uh, 94,000 people uh, in 2015. There's a program called Upstream, which is a subject of litigation now in, uh, in, in various courts around the country. Upstream is a program under which the NSA taps international telecommunications ca uh, cables and scans the content of uh, emails and other electronic communications for keywords. So this is surveillance that implicates you know, anybody who communicates on, that, uh, on those cables, and all of us communicate on those cables. It's not a program that is limited, whose effects are limited to, um, uh, to targets, let alone targets with respect to whom the, the, the NSA or the FBI has probable cause. Uh, I think that it's you know, mass surveillance under any, any reasonable definition of that term. So, but whether you agree with that characterization of it or not, I, I think it's difficult to disagree with the proposition that the government surveillance authority has expanded quite dramatically uh, over the last 20 or so years. Um, now, I think it's difficult to assess the privacy implications of, um, uh, uh, of that kind of surveillance, but it's even more difficult to assess the implications of that surveillance for the freedoms of speech and association and the press. Um, I think that the implications, though, are likely to be significant, even if they're subtle uh, or gradual. And that's because a person who believes that the government is listening to their phone calls is likely to communicate very differently. Or if, if a person believes that um, uh, somebody is monitoring their activity on the internet, they're going to behave differently on the internet. 
Um, uh, I think some, you know, somebody stood up here at the beginning of this session and said, uh, you guys should know that your mics are, um, uh, are connected to the live stream, right? And I think that um, that kind of comment has a chilling effect. It's intended sometimes to have an, a chilling effect <laughs> on, um, uh, you know, on, on, on your willingness to say certain things. Now, you know, if, if the only chilling effect is on people's willingness to uh, conspire to carry out terrorist attacks, then that would be one thing. Uh, but I think it would be naive to think that the chilling effect were so limited. Um, there are many things that people might worry uh, would be misconstrued by government, uh, by, by government agents listening in on their phone calls or reading their emails. Uh, there are many things that m people might find embarrassing uh, that they won't, they won't communicate if they know um, th those things are being recorded. So I think that, you know, again, it's difficult to measure all of this, but um, it's, to me, it seems like common sense that people are going to act differently. Uh, if they believe, and believe justifiably, that government agents are, in some sense, monitoring their communications. Um, maybe more consequential than, than the fact that everything is collected, or seemingly everything is collected, is that nothing is deleted. Um, you know, you, you, it's one thing to have to worry that anything you do online will be tracked. It's another thing to have to worry as well that 20 years from now or 30 years from now, somebody is going to um, dig up from an old email or an old communication of some other kind, something that can be used against you in who knows what way. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear now that in some sense every error you make, every decision you, you, you make, uh, is going to stay with you, right? And I think we're only beginning to think about or, or consider uh, how that is going to affect our behavior, our interactions with one another, and our interactions with, um, with the government. There is some evidence, uh, um, growing evidence, that government surveillance and surveillance more generally is having a chilling effect on some forms of speech. There was a recent study that the Penn American Center did, the writers' organization, and found that one in six writers had curbed their content out of fear of surveillance. The writers who responded to the survey were not only, this is a quote, not only overwhelmingly worried about government surveillance, but engaging in self-censorship as a result. Um, there's another study published earlier this year in Berkeley, uh, in the Berkeley Technology Law Journal, which found that Wikimedia pages uh, that included terms associated with national security uh, were visited 20% less often in the months after the first Snowden disclosures than in the months before. The study's author wrote that his findings were consistent with, quote, a sharp immediate chilling effect and possibly with a lasting impact on total page views. Uh, there was also a study that, uh, I wasn't involved in this study, but it was the ACLU and, and Human Rights Watch. Uh, they interviewed, the, the, the interviewers talked to journalists and editors at various media organizations about the impact of government surveillance on their reporting. Uh, and the journalists reported the government surveillance and the related crackdown on unregulated contact between officials and the press had combined to, quote, constrict the flow of information concerning government activity. Um, I, I think that Steve will probably talk more about this uh, in a few minutes. But since, um, so I, I don't claim that, that you know, all of that establishes that there is some, um, the, uh, some very significant chilling effect. Uh, I do think that there's some evidence of it, and I think that it's consistent with common sense that there will be uh, that kind of chilling effect. That chilling effect, affects important individual rights, and because it does, one might expect that the courts would play a significant role in uh, considering the proper limits of the, of the surveillance. Uh, I, I don't think that they have played the role that um, one would have expected them to play. And there are, um, there are a few reasons for that, which I'll get to in one minute. I, I'm probably running out of time, right? But. Um, there, I, I want to draw a distinction quickly between two different kinds of cases. There are law enforcement cases, and I think that the Supreme Court has uh, tackled very important questions relating to uh, the right to privacy in particular and uh, new technology. One case is, of course, the Jones case, uh, in which the court held that the installation of a GPS device on somebody's car and the tracking of that person's location over a period of a month um, violated the Fourth Amendment where it was carried out without a valid warrant. Uh, the other case, more recent, is the Riley case in which the court held that the search incident to arrest doctrine doesn't extend to cell phones. So those are, I think, very important rulings that um, uh, relate to the, again, proper scope of government surveillance. 
uh, but they don't involve national security surveillance. National security surveillance, I think, has been uh, largely beyond the reach of at least the ordinary courts. Um, and that's for a few different reasons. One is, is secrecy. National security letters, for example, um, as I mentioned, tens of thousands of them issued every year, each one of them comes accompanied with a gag order that prevents the person who receives it from talking about it, from even disclosing the fact that they receive, uh, received the letter. And that makes it difficult to seek legal advice, it makes it difficult to sue. Um, secrecy surrounding the use of these kinds of surveillance authorities also makes it difficult for plaintiffs to establish standing. Um, I was involved in a case um, that went to the Supreme Court in 2012 uh, called Clapper v. Amnesty. Uh, we represented plaintiffs who, the plaintiffs were challenging the constitutionality of the FISA Amendments Act of 2008. Their, uh, their argument was that their communications fell within the scope of the law and that the law was likely to be used to monitor their communications. Uh, and the court said, uh, five to four, that uh, they hadn't established standing because they hadn't established a certainty that their communications would be monitored. Um, you know, whatever you, you, you think of, of that decision, I think you know, one, 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 uh, one result is that very few plaintiffs are going to have uh, the ability to challenge the constitutionality of government surveillance uh, because very few people are going to be in the position of being able to show that their communications were, as a matter of uh, certainty, uh, intercepted under these national security uh, authorities. Uh, you know, the related reason why these uh, programs have been kept from the courts is that uh, there's a kind of incentive structure that, that uh, under which the intermediaries who hold this information, so a lot of this information is held by AT&T or Verizon or the technology companies, they don't always have an interest in protecting the rights of um, um, or certainly going to court to protect the rights of their users, especially when the users don't know that their privacy or their, uh, uh, their rights more generally are implicated uh, because of the secrecy surrounding the surveillance, right? So when a, a national security letter is served on uh, AT&T, for example, the subject of the national security letter doesn't know about the national security letter and so can't go to court to challenge it. AT&T may not see an interest in challenging uh, the constitutionality of the demand, especially because AT&T um, is a heavily regulated company and has an interest in staying on the good side of the, uh, of the regulators. So those incentives don't really um, uh, create an environment in which uh, litigation naturally uh, occurs. Uh, there is, and maybe this is sort of the final point I'll make, there, there is a court, of course, that does review the lawfulness of this um, uh, national security surveillance. It's, it's, the, it's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, that's a court that meets in secret, generally lets only the government appear before it, and doesn't uh, ordinarily publish its decisions. Now, it has existed in that way since 1978, but it's important to recognize that its role now is very different from the role it played in 1978. In 1978, what the court was doing was considering applications for individual surveillance of individuals, and it would consider whether the government had met its probable cause burden. Um, so that was very, uh, uh, it was analogous to what courts do in the ordinarily, in the ordinary, uh, in ordinary crimin criminal cases. Uh, more recently, since 2008, the court, the FISA court, has been reviewing the validity of broad programs of surveillance, um, like the call records program I mentioned earlier, or uh, the upstream program, uh, not considering um, the, the legitimacy of any specific target, but at a very broad level considering the lawfulness of these, these programs. And I think the argument for secrecy there is much weaker uh, than it is in the context of a specific defendant, uh, where to disclose the existence of the case is to tip off somebody who, um, uh, you know, with uh, uh, somebody who is planning perhaps, um, you know, a terrorist attack. So, let me just say um, uh, uh, finally that um, I think that there are a few reasons to be uh, to think that the surveillance debate we are going to have over the next. 10 months may be different from the, one we, the ones we've had over the last 20 years. Um, one, one reason has to do with transparency. Since the Snowden disclosures, the government has become much more transparent 
about uh, national security surveillance. Uh, initially, it did this because Snowden had disclosed some information, and in order to respond to Snowden's disclosures, it, the government felt uh, that other information would have to be uh, released. But I think that has created a kind of muscle memory, um, and now the, the, the National Security Agency um, uh, is accustomed to releasing information in a way that it certainly wasn't five years ago. Uh, now that, you know, that we have a new administration, and perhaps that, that will change, but I think that the agency, the NSA, um, uh, in particular, um, has different habits now than it did, did five years ago. A second reason why this debate may be different is that the courts are uh, engaged in a slightly different way now than they were five years ago, and that is almost entirely because of the Snowden disclosures. The, the, the Snowden disclosures forced, again, the government to release certain information, and once that information was released, uh, plaintiffs were able to go into court to challenge these national security policies in a way that they weren't able to when all of this was, was secret. And those cases uh, may uh, ultimately influence the congressional debate. Um, and then finally, um, I, I think that it's hard to, to it, it's worth asking to what extent the, the debates we had over the last 20 years or since 9-11 uh, were affected by the trust that large numbers of Americans had in the government. Uh, and I certainly think over the last um, eight years, large number of Americans were willing to invest powers in the presidency because they trusted the president. Um, now, those powers have outlasted the president who those Americans trusted. And uh, we'll see whether Americans are willing to extend the same deference to this administration as they were to the last administration. And we'll see whether the courts are willing to extend the same deference to this administration as they were to the last administration. But that, that too, uh, may have a significant impact on um, the shape of the surveillance debate we're about to have. Thank you. Thank you. Dean Cole, can you Tell us how you view some of these privacy and press concerns from the perspective of the newsroom. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, I do think my remarks constitute a kind of annex uh, to the panel. Not, uh, uh, I don't speak the same vernacular. I'm a working reporter as well as the dean of the journalism school. I was, as I was listening, I sort of thought from your perspective, my remarks would be like someone coming up last and speaking to you in French. But. Uh, <laughs> My, my goal is to give you a feel for what these issues are like in a working newsroom, a professional newsroom where I've spent most of my life. Um, we take a lot of advice from lawyers. One of the first uh, lessons you teach a new reporter is you should know when you need to call a lawyer. Uh, that's a good way to stay employed. Um, and a lot of the newsroom's engagement with privacy per se, as I understand it, um, has been pretty stable during my working life. Uh, so that involves issues like how you deal with reporting on minors, how you think about your role as a reporter in a public space, uh, what constitutes trespassing for you as a journalist, how do you, how do you recognize when you're in danger of trespassing. Um, and then more broadly in the Sullivan regime, the distinction between public and private figures, how that, how that Im implicates your published work and the decision making uh, that you and your editors will go through as you get ready to, to press um, publish. For us, a, a trial like Hulk Hogan um, is one of those cases where we count on people like Professor Monta to ar articulate why um, that is a newsworthy decision. Uh, we would prefer to be in court around cases, obviously, that have a more direct, implicit tie to the public interest, even if that's not really what the, the law is set up to, to distinguish around. Uh, so we're, we're much more interested in trying uh, to implicitly defend our position under the First Amendment and our specific privileges under state law and our um, evolving, often diminishing privileges um, as, as professionals under the First Amendment uh, by staying close to matters that most would recognize as uh, touching on the public interest. So I think all of that regime to us has felt pretty stable. But there's a couple of things that have really changed in the last five or 10 years. And they've changed the experience of working reporters. They've changed uh, the issues that we're anxious about. 
and um, they, they may, some of them clearly touch on the law, um, but others touch really more on professional practice, ethical norms, uh, and debates within journalism that are actually quite active now. We had a conference uh, today at the school that was all about covering this administration with lots of reporters and editors and uh, in conversation uh, over, over the full day. And some of the issues I'm gonna mention now, uh, like the, the big data uh, leaks and hacks, uh, were very much a part of that conversation. And it's very early stages uh, in the search for new kind of professional norms. In fact, one of the panels was about someone proposing a new norm for how you interrogate um, massive data dumps of unknown provenance uh, and decide whether or not to make journalistic use out of them. I don't think it was a persuasive uh, offer, but it, it got the conversation going and it signals that there's a, a sort of new set of questions that journalists are rec uh, reckoning with. So um, I remember when the first WikiLeaks uh, big dump of U.S. information came out that was maybe what? Jamil, 2008, 2009. Uh, the, I remember the State Department cables ran through early 2009, so not too long after that. And Bill Keller, who had been the uh, editor of the New York Times, uh, wrote a column or said uh, something in public around the idea that, well, I don't think this is going to happen very often. So as an ethical problem, uh, it's probably a one-off. I mean, who's going to be able to really walk out with this kind of uh, thumb drive full of massive data and information? Well, so journalists, are, I, you know, with, we have a poor record of forecasting, uh, it can be said uh, again and again. Um, but coming to terms with uh, these, these uh, big data, technology-enabled, thumb drive-enabled uh, disclosures uh, has really been a very slow, um, slowly recognized problem in journalism for decision makers. I think uh, initially there was a kind of sense that, well, we can take uh, shelter and jurisprudence that protects the use of these materials no matter where they came from, and let's just review them the, the way we'd review any document uh, to determine whether or not there are privacy concerns that need to be shielded and determine whether there are matters of public interest that can be reported upon. The documents themselves may only be the beginning of a reporting process, just a trigger to go out into the world and figure out uh, things that you wouldn't otherwise have had a stimulation to report on. Um, or they may be uh, disclosures in and of themselves that are clearly in the, in the public interest and we can protect uh, privacy while we, while we go through our filtering decision making in the newsroom. So that kind of prevailed through the first set of disclosures which involved uh, often um, uh, government uh, materials, uh, certainly in the case of the first WikiLeaks, relatively low levels of classification, comparably low levels of sensitivity compared to the Snowden disclosures. Then you had the Snowden episode which raised uh, the challenge to journalism, he said that he had uh, decided to use uh, collaboration with journalists because he didn't want himself to make the decisions about what matters were in the public interest, what were too sensitive to publish, and so he decided to ask you know, reporters like Bart Gelman to, to go through that process. That created a whole other set of uh, anxieties and discussions about how to manage these kinds of disclosures, especially since uh, uh, Mr. Snowden was uh, a fugitive from the United States at the time, uh, and still is. Um, so then you get the Sony hack. And I think that was about the first time, at least in my experience in professional newsrooms, that I heard editors and reporters say, wait a second, <laughs> this, this is a departure. Uh, this came, we don't really know where it came from. Uh, unnamed government officials um, quoting intelligence assessments say that it came from North Korea, uh, that North Korea was angry about a film. Uh, the disclosures in the emails um, don't pertain to governmental decision making by and large. They pertain to the decision making of filmmakers, a lot of gossip about who was borrowing whose private jet, and enormous unfiltered amounts of private medical information, uh, private uh, correspondence about family matters, um, and while editors went through that material and decided that there, was, uh, there were stories in the public interest about cultural uh, kind of uh, control and decision making and, and how Hollywood really works and who has power and gender and various other subjects, um, it was an uncomfortable uh, exercise that started this conversation. And then comes 2016. Uh, when about halfway through the disclosure of these uh, DNC and, and, uh, and other hacked emails, uh, 
uh, comes the assessment that this is actually an active intelligence operation by the Russian government. Uh, so now the question of provenance uh, enters into this discourse. And it's really only after the election that journalists have really started to wrestle with what are the uh, departures from pra past ethical norms that should be considered uh, or that may be required to, um, to address decision making in circumstances like this. And I won't detain you with all of the yes buts that go into this, um, but just even in the realm of you're only responsible for your own decisions, irregardless of whether the material is out there or can get out there by other, uh, by other means, even in just that narrow realm, which doesn't necessarily change what the public would have access to, uh, this conversation is very immature, and it's all over the map. Um, and it's very, it's very interesting to be around, actually. Um, one of the disclosures in the DNC emails, for example, involved the private medical condition of an individual employee who had wrestled with uh, deep depression and attempted suicide. Now, someone may have put that into the public domain, but as a reporter who's making calls and working on this material, I mean, how do you, how do you have a, an ethical approach to separating out uh, defining privacy around that kind of data. The same thing was true in the Sony uh, emails. You know, by and large, there weren't catastrophic decisions made. Uh, whoever decided to dump this into the public realm is responsible for that decision. But it's not a frontier that reporters and editors are used to wrestling with uh, in, in real time, especially with the speed of publishing in the digital age. So um, I'll just read you something I wrote down. Uh, from this proffer today at our conference about what is the, so what's the new professional norm? Uh, so this professor at the University of Kansas did a lot of reporting and talking to other journalists about this. He said, it is morally just to publish stolen information if the material is in the public interest and truthful, not available any other way, and the benefit of publishing it outweighs the harm. All right, so that's the, that's the kind of level of beginning that you can, you can hear in newsrooms uh, uh, around, around the country, and it, I don't think it, it was uh, uh, considered persuasive, but as I say, it's, it's, it's a conversation that you wouldn't have heard a year ago um, at all. So uh, the second point I wanted to make about the era of big data leaks is the one that Jamil touched on and, and mentioned, which is reporting in the age of surveillance, um, of pervasive surveillance. So this has, uh, there's two elements to this uh, that I just thought I'd mentioned because they're, they're very alive in uh, the work of, uh, of professional reporters, and my own and, and others. So um, one is uh, the practical source management obligations that reporters manage when they enter into confidentiality agreements with sources. Now we all saw the story the other day when Sean Spicer called his staff into the press room and asked them to dump their phones. I don't know whether he pressed on their signal apps to see uh, whether there were conversations that were still there, but uh, the, the combination of encryption uh, and surveillance uh, has really scrambled just hygiene questions for professional reporters. I mean, it used to be that uh, it was fairly clear in a newsroom how uh, a professional reporter should manage confidential relationships and promises that they've made to protect sources. Uh, it was one of the things that the lawyers would come down and brief on from time to time. Because, for example, they would say, if you go in front of a judge and assert a state law privilege uh, to protect your confidential source, um, and the judge discovers that you went to the water cooler and gossiped with your friends or went out to a bar and talked about who your great source was, the judge is likely to say, that doesn't constitute professionalism where you, you've lost your privilege through that kind of sloppiness. So the lawyers were always telling us, if you want to defend your privilege or assert one, you better have strong hygiene practices. Uh, and so that became part of the norms of a newsroom. If you had a confidential source rela relationship that was making its way into the paper, you would have a very careful uh, cone around that disclosure. There might only be one or two people in the newsroom who would know the details. And, and there would be lots of record uh, management and, and phone call management, metadata management around maintaining that relationship uh, as successfully as possible. And you have, so you have two obligations. One is to the advice that you'd, that you'd better defend your privilege, and the other is to your source, which, you, which ought to be um, your, your deepest concern. So 
What constitutes hygiene now in the age of pervasive surveillance? There have been, uh, during the Obama administration, with its much noted uh, surge of prosecutions of, of uh, government sources of journalists, leakers, whistleblowers, um, a number of those cases were made off of surveillance data without even touching uh, subpoenas to, to journalists. Uh, one of them involving a former CIA officer named John Kiriakou. Uh, essentially, we don't know all the details, and the Reporters Committee has just tried to uh, obtain more records about this, but from the circumstantial evidence and the history of the case, it looks like um, the um, Justice Department or uh, uh, the FBI initiated an intelligence investigation at Guantanamo, uh, fearful that there had been a breach of security among prisoners uh, at, the, at the facility. Uh, in the course of that investigation, they collected a lot of email. Uh, eventually, they decided that their fears were unwarranted and that the material that had triggered the intelligence investigation had an innocent explanation. But while they collected all of the email associated with the intelligence investigation, they discovered correspondence between the officer and journalists about unrelated matters. And then by some mechanism of the Patriot Act that I don't fully understand and that isn't always very uh, transparent, they converted that email evidence into criminal evidence and prosecuted the leaker without ever subpoenaing uh, any of the reporters who had been in contact with them. So as a reporter, if you're trying to protect a source of that character, you have to be aware that all of your email correspondence, all of your metadata is potentially putting your, is potentially breaching your pledge of confidentiality and you have a duty of hygiene and best practice that you now have to rethink. So for the first time in my professional life, you have people coming into newsrooms training reporters on digital security. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing to teach and assess in the context of journalism practice because you're moving fast, you're constantly communicating, you're on deadline. Uh, it's the best training that I've seen basically starts with a threat assessment. What are you worried about? What are you vulnerable for? Are you trying to maintain a confidential source relationship? All right, well then, let's talk about how to do that. Are you traveling? overseas to a, a country with centralized surveillance that's going to basically eat your laptop and pull everything in it out, including all of the records you may have of contacts with confidential sources, then you have to behave in a different way. I mean, I would basically travel uh, to sensitive countries now with a clean computer. It's expensive, but it's the best advice I have, which is just to leave my stuff at home. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a whole new set of practices that involve uh, the, the kind of the core um, obligations of journalism. And then the final thing I would say, maybe more touches on where, where you live, which is uh, in, in jurisprudence of these leak cases. During the Obama administration, there was one case involving a Fox News reporter uh, and an, another case involving the Associated Press where um, memoranda, not I guess in the end court filings, but uh, memoranda generated around subpoenas by the Holder Justice Department, it came as close as I've ever seen in my working life to criminalizing the receipt of classified information by a journalist. Uh, and the, the, when, they, um, when the administration departed from 25 years of attorney general guidelines about subpoena notification in the AP case, that created an uproar and uh, the attorney general tried to reset his uh, commitments to these guidelines. and, and and did so by the end of his administration. But the, the, uh, the kind of arguments and the, and the proposition of criminalizing the, the receiving side of journalist uh, encounters with, with uh, government sources um, is now, I think, uh, in motion. And I, I am expecting that during this administration um, that there will be prosecutions of this kind uh, in one setting or another. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, at this point, remotely surprised. And uh, then we'll turn to Jamil and others to, to get us out of jail. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, that's, but that, is, that, to me, is the, is, the, is the final consequence of where the surveillance state ends up. Uh, it's, it's really located in national security reporting primarily. But I think it is uh, it's something entirely new in my you know, 30 plus years of professional experience. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.
late, my understanding is that we do have time to go over a little bit, and the discussion prompted at least two questions in my mind that neatly um, each implicates at least two of our panelists. So let me start with um, one for um, Professor Manta and Dean Cole. Um, if, if I understood you correctly, Professor Manta, you think that when um, there are questions that implicate claimed um, invasions of privacy countered by claims of freedom of the press because it's a matter of public interest, that the question of whether something is indeed of public interest ought to develop in the common law tradition, that it ought to be by consent. Did I understand you correctly? Yes. Um, so I think that's Well, I just want to make sure I understood that. The question I want to ask both you and Dean Cole is that suggests that then the um, decision would be made after the fact, after the action was taken. And I wonder whether the um, press really feels comfortable operating that way with its decisions then submitted after the fact to a fact finder as to whether this was indeed a matter of public interest or whether when we're talking about a constitutional right, you need some understanding of um, what can be done in advance. It's, it's, it's you who proposed the idea, Professor, so maybe you could tell us how you see this working out, and then Dean, if you could comment on it. Thank you, yeah, so this is why I, I touched on, uh, very briefly, on the, the issue of rules versus standards, uh, because that, that is the eternal problem that we have in, in these kinds of situations. And I think that pretty much whatever statute is either going to be uh, fairly extreme and it's going to have to exclude large matters or, or be over-inclusive in other ways, right, because we could also go the other way, um, or it will ultimately devolve into the same problems that we're already dealing with. So if the regulation tries to be nuanced and will require nuance and in interpretation, then we're back to the same difficulties that we're already facing in common law. And I think what's going to end up happening and what has been happening is that reporters and you know, others can, can confirm or deny this, uh, look at, all right, what is, what is the law on the books? What is the common law or, or other laws? And then they think of a little bit of a buffer zone around that. And they try to figure out okay, just how far can we push this? And maybe we're going to try to be just a little bit more prudent than how far we think we can actually go. So wherever the law is going to end up being, uh, as a journalist, one would still have to be, an, as an intermediary and whatnot, one would still have to be concerned uh, as to what the precise interpretation is going to be. Uh, and so we have to be aware of that, that when we support or, or don't support the way that a court comes out, that we are aware that journalists are gonna pull back from that a little bit and that news entities, uh, and again, we saw this in the Gawker example, are going to have to be aware of the costs of defending lawsuits, even when it's lawsuits that uh, maybe are not really uh, going to be winning ones. So I think that's going to create all kinds of uh, boundaries around that. Yeah, I, to, the, to the extent I understood Professor Mounta's uh, framework when she was speaking, I, I found it quite a comfortable one, and I thought it, it is the way uh, the law operates in newsrooms now. The common law framework does seem inevitable, even when you're talking about something that's um, on the books like a state shield law, that in inevitably it becomes a subject of circumstance and, and interpretation. You end up getting best judgment advice. And the effect is what you say. Generally, when you come up to the threshold of a risky decision, um, everybody's in the room. If it's a healthy organization, the editor makes the final decision. And I would say, in general, unless it is an urgent matter of public interest or something deep at the heart of the mission, the decision will be just seven-eighths of what it is that it looks like you could uh, defend. And, uh, and that's okay. I mean, 99% of the times, th we have a robust press <laughs> in this country. I mean, people are not... Uh, uh, cowering. The problem is somewhat a loss of professional confidence, uh, professional resources, but where, where core values are at issue, where you feel that the reporting is at the heart of constitutional design, <laughs> this is our function, we should, then you, you see again and again uh, news organizations are willing to go all in around, around that decision. So 
I find that the, the flexibility of what I understand uh, you to be uh, defending, proposing, um, appropriate for the, the actual circumstances of this kind of decision making because there just, there just are not any bright lines around um, most of the significant dilemmas. Yeah, I disagree um, with just about everything that's been said on this. And <laughs> uh, let me explain why I do. If you recall, I said essentially obligations of confidentiality. If you have something that you're not allowed to use, uh, you don't use it. And that applies to the press like it does to everybody else. Uh, so to me, all this wonderful stuff about judgment and discretion on how you talk about it is perfectly appropriate if you find information in the public domain about somebody. The famous case of Cox v. Cohen is an illustration of that, in which there is now public record that somebody was a rape victim. And you can decide in good journalistic sense whether or not to uh, keep it down. And everything that the dean said I think is going to be appropriate in this case. Uh, if I think somebody tried to shut him down from publishing it, uh, the current law is you can't do that. And I think that's probably the correct answer. Uh, on the other hand, if you know the information is stolen or if you're stealing it yourself, I think jail is too kind. Um, somebody like uh, Snowden, I mean, the idea that this man, as a low-level employee, can determine national policy as to what is or is not released and then can justify himself by turning it over to a bunch of rogue reporters to decide which in the public interest is or is not there is utterly and completely unacceptable. Uh, the rule is if the press gets stuff which it knows is stolen, it doesn't read it, it essentially returns it. Now this, of course, has one very serious downside, and one has to talk about the institutional issue, which is just as I don't trust you, <laughs> I'm not really keen on trusting the government because there is a huge risk of overclassification of information that ought to go out by these people. So what happens is there's been too little talk here of institutions and too much talk of entitlement. And I think the correct situation is somebody like Snowden wants to do this. He could write the following editorial. Um, in my work, it seems to me that government surveillance is more extensive than it ought to be. And then somebody could have a congressional committee or perhaps some standing body which can decide A, if it's true, and B, how you ought to reform this. And C, can actually demand under some circumstances the declassification of doctrines that are already classified. Uh, but the thought that you're going to delegate those decisions dealing with national security, the life and death of other individuals, to journalists seems to me to be wrong. So you're asking what the legal rule is. If you know it's stolen, you can't use it, you can't receive it, you can't do anything with it, is in fact uh, the correct rule. And at that particular point, the repost is, having turned all the stuff back and not released it and not used it and not cooperated with it, uh, then you have to have the public inquiry as to whether or not declassification is appropriate. I think if you're going to try and have these delicate ex post judgments on these things, it's an open invitation for disaster. I once wrote a book called Simple Rules for a Complex World, and this is a case in which those seem to me appropriate and perfectly consistent with the common law tradition, utterly inconsistent with the constitutional tradition, so much worse for the constitutional tradition. Well, my next question may, is to you, Professor, uh, to uh, Mr. Jaffer, so let me uh, give you an opportunity to speak to my question as well as that. One of the points you made in speaking was that um, it had perhaps been the case, you hypothesized, that over the last eight years, courts may have trusted the executive more than they will you were projecting in the next eight years. And I was wondering whether you are ex putting that forward as just a fact of human nature or whether you think that, in fact, should inform judicial decision making. Um, because, of course, when judges make a decision about how the executive acted in one circumstance, its ruling is going to affect future executives making decisions. So I wasn't quite sure how you intended that. So you can perhaps answer that and anything else you want to comment on. <laughs> sure. So, so um, you know, when, whenever... Whenever I, I would argue one of these national security cases challenging the scope of the government's authority, one of my strategies, and this was you know, a common strategy among civil liberties lawyers and human rights lawyers, 
was to uh, spin out the ways in which the authority could be abused. Um, sometimes that worked and sometimes you know, it, it didn't. I, I think that uh, judges do consider the possibility of abuse in the future, but I, I think that um, the possibility of abuse in the future can sometimes seem remote or uh, speculative in a way that, um, you know, I'm not sure how many people um, expected the developments that have taken place over the last few months, and, and those developments, I think, have changed the way that people see, a lot of people see executive power. Um, um, you know, when we, when we argued the, the, the drone cases, the targeted killing cases, um, you, the, main, the main argument we made was that, well, you may think that this guy who's, who's been targeted by the government uh, right now is a, is a bad guy, but you don't know who the next administration is, is going to target. I, I think that the, the specifics of the case before the court had so much weight that, um, in, in my humble opinion, the courts didn't always put sufficient uh, or give sufficient consideration to the possibility uh, that that power would be used in different ways in the future. That may just be a fact of human nature. You know, people deal with the concrete facts that are before them, and you know, considerations of abuse 10 or 20 years from now, uh, those will always seem uh, remote, and, and, and people will trust that judges at that point will act differently. Um, you know, so maybe it's it, maybe it's inevitable, but, but inevitable. But but I think it is a fact that the the that the courts, um, uh, the courts were were highly influenced by the specifics of the cases before them, um, and whether that's a good thing, you know, whether that's a good thing or not. So just just uh, just well, one judges response. are always deciding the cases before them. But, no, look, that's you know. that's right. But it's a question. They're deciding the case before them. But they're deciding, you know, in deciding the the, the case before them, they are often sketching out the authority that the government or weighing in on the authority that the government. Professor has. Epstein, you wanted to comment on this one too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's no surprise there. Look, I, I still think, want to respond to your other point. Okay, but okay. that's true. I'll respond to this one, and you should go after that one, and, and <laughs> go after. Um, I'm all in favor of it. Look, I think as a matter of jurisprudence, it's extraordinarily dangerous to say that the rules that I apply to one administration are different from those that you apply to another. Um, I am in the rad position of having very little respect for the current or the past administration. <laughs> but, and, but that doesn't seem to me to matter one way or another. And in fact, one of the reasons why the rule that I mentioned, if you get stolen information, you return it and you don't use it, is it's invariant to administrations and it's much more easy to administer. The other point on the drones, let me explain, I think, much more concretely. There were two major issues on this question, one of which I think was a loser, the other was a winner. Uh, the loser was where you can't bomb citizens when they're overseas engaged in acts of treason against the United States because you have to give them a trial, to which I think the right answer is we've got you, Guy. Either you come out and submit to the jurisdiction or we will treat you as though you are, in fact, somebody who's an enemy of the state to be treated like any enemy combatant. And I think that's the powerful argument. But the other one on the administration is what caused it. They used to say we really had surgical precision. And what they did is they had some guy who was a known terrorist sitting at a table with eight people. And their calculation was if eight people were sitting at the table with one known terrorist, they were all terrorists. And it turns out they weren't. And so at that point, the serious overbreath problem with respect to the use of drones became much more important. And as that information became much more public, the support for the program, it seemed to me, collapsed. And what you had to do was, again, try to narrow its scope uh, because the excess problem is something which you always have to face. It's a political judgment, I think, to some extent. But boy, oh boy, if you're being 10 to 1 on the wrong side um, and you could wait a day or so to do something else and there's no imminent catastrophe, uh, the administration will lose support, and that's what happened. Now you should answer. <laughs> I just want to make one point. I feel like I'm about to be struck by lightning for saying this, but I think I disagree with Richard. Uh, and on the point of, on the point of um, uh, the stolen property, let, let, actually, let's go there. Because Richard and I, we both love property law. And uh, uh, when we're talking about the government, right, and, and Edward Snowden stealing the, the information, 
Well, that was sort of some of it at least, and we have to differentiate between the different types of pieces of information that Snowden released, and there, there are different judgments one can make about them. But some of those pieces arguably were stolen property in the first place. Whether one agrees with that or not, as, as far as the, the things are concerned that defies the court blessed, fine. But the government hacked Google. They hacked Google and they took information. That was stolen But you're not suggesting that the thief who steals from the thief is... She is, and that's frightening. <laughs> You know, we, in many contexts, we treat stolen property differently, right, and, and unlawful property differently. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, maybe I, I would like Richard to be just a little bit less harsh on Snowden on that point, but oh, I, I no, think I'm going to not go anywhere here. But, but we, we don't have much time, so I don't want us to just evolve into a Snowden case. No, I promised Mr. Jaffer that he could respond to. Well, I, I just have, have a, a, a much more mundane question about your, you know, your proposal. So. You know, your, your proposal, if, if, if your rule had been in place, you know, we, we wouldn't, there's so many things we wouldn't have known over the last 20 years, right? We wouldn't have known about Abu Ghraib. We wouldn't have known about the rendition program. If the Washington Post had said, this is stolen information that these people are giving to us, we're not going to publish it. And the courts wouldn't ha have had the opportunity to weigh in on the constitutionality of the call records program, which they found unlawful. Well, um, the question is, do you really think that a program that comprehensive, you're dealing with only with stolen information? I don't believe that you have that problem. Because one of the other questions you have to ask is what you could cover by independent information. And let me give you an illustration. Um, uh, Nick Lewis of the New York Times at one time did a work for the Constitution uh, Commission on, debt, on unlawful detention, and there was a commission of which I was a member looking at this stuff. This guy essentially did a much better job with no inside information than did the Feinstein Committee with all the inside information that it had. And if you look at the two reports, you could see it which of those two uh, turns out to be the better document. So I think, in effect, the press in many of these cases can go around it. I also think, and this is extremely important, the other half of my proposal is that once you decide that uh, people like Snowden, of all people, uh, cannot release the information, you then have to develop internal institutions uh, which will essentially check and vet the information. This is very similar to the fact that when you keep Emily combatants, habeas corpus is not an adequate remedy because it's a once and for all thing. You have to have internal institutional arrangements to update the investigations that you're doing and then do it through channels, but the idea that Snowden is the man to make these decisions. How many people have been murdered in consequence of it? I think it's a very high price to pay. Well, I think we're coming close to the end of our time, but um, I did say that we would take a few questions. Is that okay? Do we have to? Sir. All right. Uh, my name's Giovanni. Nice and loud. If you've you got to get the green light on. Push the button with your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Now, just, you know, speak, <laughs> speak up loud. All right, can you all hear me? All right, so way back at the beginning of this panel, um, Dr. Epstein, you had mentioned about a reasonable expectation of privacy. I was thinking about the legality of recording conversations and how some states you don't need the consent of an opposing party to record those conversations. If a federal privacy law were passed by Congress that... Um, would nullify any of this ability to record conversations. For instance, it uh, said even with consent, you're not allowed to record conversation. Would this override any state laws? Of, you know, given federalism, yeah, but do you not think some states would fight it? the supremacy clause, go yeah. ahead. Well, I mean, the supremacy clause is a nightmare issue, and I would think on this question it would, but I think the first thing you'd want to do is to do this as a matter of contract law. And this is the way I think it would be structured. A, if I enter into a conversation with you, the general presumption is that neither of us is recording it. And then B, if one of the parties wants to record it, it discloses it to the other so that he could take the like privilege. The last thing you want is this to be asymmetrical where I can record it, use it selectively or destroy it if I don't like it, and leave you helpless. And so if you did that kind of a routine, I think it's a better solution than any public censor. But in, in the federal courts, the um, rule is that the consent of one party is enough to um, to make the, uh, the the recording legal. So okay. Um, well, we have to revisit. That. We have to revisit that. Well, then not not tonight, though. Okay. <laughs> so uh, one, two, three. Can you hear me? It's all right. All right. Um, all right. I'll say it loud. 
All right, so we have uh, the, uh, what I consider to be the thin-skinned media having a complete meltdown about President Trump right now and not calling on CNN. Don't sugarcoat it. Tell us how Times. you really feel. Well, I mean, I mean uh, I've not been known to do that, which is why I love Professor Epstein. But um, the, so you have, we've, I've heard tonight, trust in the past eight years, and suddenly in the last four months, you know, we're supposed, the media is having a meltdown. Is President Trump violating his his oath of office and the Constitution by not calling on or giving a seat to the New York Times, Washington Post, and CNN? Or is he trying to undelicately, surgically uh, deal with the terrible fake news? Because I can, I, you know, the, the, because the media is, 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 is acting like their, their entire popularity has only been going down since September the 6th. I'm going to treat that as an <laughs> observation, not a question. Well, but there is, no, 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 but, well, there is, but is, is, there, is there an issue with the law? But I, I think that um, our timing is coming to a close. There, there, are, two, <laughs> there are two points, though, that I, I do want to make about privacy. Um, and um, I, I, I trust the panel one? won't think I overstate this. First of all, in dealing with national security issues, there are a host of issues that Mr. Jaffer touched on only briefly, but I just want to comment on one about secret courts and secret warrants. You should be mindful that most warrants issued in this country are issued by courts in camera without both sides there. Now, how they are litigated after the fact or what disclosure obligations have to be made to the parties affected may differ very much from national security warrants, but you should not think that the only warrants that issue without an adversarial proceeding are national security warrants. Most warrants issue that way. The other thing I wanted to observe is that um, the Supreme Court's privacy jurisprudence in the criminal area, criminal law enforcement area, um, bears your attention because they have not yet come up with an explanation in cases like Jones and other cases for exactly why they are reaching the conclusion that it's unreasonable. And why I say this is because a cynic might view it as the problem is that it can be done too effectively now through modern technology, because it was always the understanding that if you put a police officer in an unmarked car and he traveled around all day with someone, you could surveil them. There was no need for a warrant or anything to do that. But you can't put the GPS tracking device on, and it sometimes might seem that that's because it's gonna be, you know, there's no chance of losing the guy. The police officer might lose the guy. So I don't think that Fourth Amendment jurisprudence can reduce simply to, well, you've gotta give them a sporting chance. Um, you have the trespasses. So, so um, there, I think there's more to come in this whole area of criminal protections which have a privacy implication as well as the, um, the other areas. I want to thank everybody on the panel. I want to thank all of you and, of course, our hosts. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, before the reception, we have an award to present. Um, the Columbia Law School chapter of the Federalist Society is honored to present Judge Richard Sullivan with our Columbia Law Alexander Hamilton Award this year. Judge Sullivan joins former recipients of the award, Judge Michael McKaysey and Chief Judge Preska, as an individual who has provided support and engagement with Columbia Law School and the Federalist Society chapter here this year. In addition to teaching as an adjunct professor here at Columbia, he also has participated in a number of our Federalist Society events, including the panel tomorrow, and we are extremely extremely grateful for his invaluable contribution to our community. So thank you so much, Judge Sullivan. Well, thank you. What, the, what I've learned from the events of the last week is that one should always wait a few moments before you accept an award. Um, so, uh, they said I could have the microphone for a few minutes, and so this is the only way you can silence Richard Epstein, so I'm going to take advantage. <laughs> uh, 
I will say this is a great honor. I, I teach here, so that's a part of the honor. I also, I will tell you, I came to my first student symposium uh, sponsored by the Federal Society uh, in 30 years ago. I think you were there, actually. You spoke. <laughs> 30 years ago after my first year, after my first year in law school. Uh, and so this brings back a lot of memories. I will say this is a great event. It's great to see so many people here. The panels are just stocked with talent, and so I'm excited to see these panels, as I'm sure you are. One of the things I have noticed over the years at Federal Society events is that uh, they tend to feature appellate types and professor types. The district courts are not terribly represented at these things. And so I've often wondered why. And I was at an event recently, and uh, a judge who was on the Court of Appeals explained to our, the audience that we were having this conversation with, he said, well, you're more of a retail judge, is what he said. <laughs> and I thought that was an interesting comment. And I don't think he was suggesting that I'm in sort of the Walmart of judging. Um, <laughs> I think what he meant, I mean, I think he would acknowledge that district courts do, of course, decide important issues of law. And that, in fact, we get the first crack at all the really interesting legal issues. Um, but I think he's right that we rarely get the last word. And our primary function really is to interact with the public and the people we serve through the courts. And if that's retail, then I'm OK with it. Um, the fact is that we really do deal with litigants. We deal with the parties and the lawyers at hearings and conferences and arguments. Uh, we pour water for witnesses as we listen to them testify. Uh, in criminal matters, we sentence an individual, looking him in the eye and explaining to him and to his family and to the victims and their families why this sentence that might involve years or even decades is just and appropriate and right under the law. Um, that's difficult at times, but it's noble and it's inspiring, and so I have to say it's, uh, it's a good job. And one of the other things we do in interacting with the public is that we preside over jury selection. Uh, and it's important to remember that the jury is, they're our partners in the law. They're the, our partners in the judicial branch. Uh, judges are, in many ways, immune from uh, the public political process once we're appointed and confirmed. But the jury is there, the ultimate check on judicial abuse and executive abuse, and that is the most democratic of institutions. And so we get to ask jurors questions to make sure that they're free from bias and fair and impartial. And also we ask questions to determine whether uh, or how the lawyers ought to exercise peremptory challenges. And so we ask questions like, what do you read? What's your primary news source? Uh, what do you do for a living? What do you do in your spare time? What do you watch on TV? And one question that I ask frequently is tell me someone you admire, which is a very interesting question. It provides some insights as to who this person is. I don't know whether it helps you pick a good jury or not, but it's an interesting question. <laughs> and you get all manner of, of, of answers to it. And at the end of a case, I invariably go back and talk to the jury to thank them for their service, because it really is service. And once in a while, they'll ask me, well, Judge, how would you have answered that question? What would your response be? Who do you admire? And I invariably say, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> no. No, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Uh, uh, I say Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> and typically, no, it's the truth. I say Alexander Hamilton. And typically, a juror will say, I have the soundtrack. Um, <laughs> and the reality is, if you don't know it, if you're living under a rock, Hamilton is, uh, is a star these days. He's on Broadway. And uh, uh, I have not seen it. Uh, I'm a federal judge. I cannot afford the ticket price. <laughs> um, <laughs> But my fascination with Hamilton goes way back. You see, I, I grew up in Long Island in a suburban town that was built after the Second World War and the building boom of that era. And it was farmland that had been plowed over, and they built a lot of houses that looked just like the ones next to them. No, I was on the North Shore, actually, in Glen Head. But, um, and it's not a fancy neighborhood, but the streets had very grand names. And they were named after presidents. And so there's Washington Avenue, and next to that is Lincoln and Garfield, and on the other side, it's, uh, it's McKinley and Roosevelt. It's crossed, uh, intersected by Harding and Coolidge. It wasn't until I got to college that I realized this guy must be a Republican and that Roosevelt was not, not FDR. I think it was Teddy. Um, <laughs> but at the top of this neighborhood was a little circle with whatever was left over. And that was my block. And that was Hamilton Square. So I always had a real uh, sense of connection to Hamilton. Uh, and then I went to the College of William and Mary in Virginia, which is, uh, that's not Hamilton country. Um, <laughs> uh, that's Jefferson's alma mater, of course. And, uh, but it didn't uh, prevent me from continuing to be a Hamiltonian. And I came back here, and for the last 30 years, I have lived within a stone's throw 
of Hamilton's grave. If you haven't been, you should check it out. It's in Trinity Churchyard downtown on the site that was originally King's College and then Columbia University before they moved uptown. Uh, and so I pass it now every day on my way to the courthouse. It is now, actually it is a tourist trap. It's sort of like Jim Morrison's grave in Paris now. You get a lot of people going, which is, hey, not, not a bad place to go. Um, but so I think of Hamilton often, and I think about his connection to this world. And, uh, and so I ask myself, why do I admire Hamilton? And I guess there's a couple of reasons. I admire Hamilton because he's an immigrant, first of all. Now that's a charged term these days. But whatever you think of illegal immigration, whatever you think of immigration policy, it's undeniable that immigrants, immigrants like Hamilton and so many after him built, have built this country. And so I pass that gravesite and I think of him and I think of my grandparents from Ireland in the 20s and my father-in-law from Cuba in the 60s. And I think these folks came here with nothing, literally nothing, except their ambition, their talent, and their determination to make it here. And I think, well, gosh, that's a legacy that's worth tapping into. And one of the great things about being a retail judge is you get to swear in new citizens. If you haven't experienced that, you really should. Uh, it is, Judge Raggi was the district court judge for 17 years, I think, right? Uh, and uh, she could tell you that there's nothing quite like it. Swearing in 150 or 60 new citizens from 40 or 50 countries and have them take the oath pledge allegiance to the flag and come and shake your hand as they get their certificate of citizenship, many with tears in their eyes. And I think of Hamilton, because uh, he was one of those immigrants. I like Hamilton because he's a New Yorker. I mean, he is. I mean, New York was a town, basically, at that point, a few thousand people, really. Um, but even then, it was a place of creativity and energy and commerce, which it is today, too. And as I walk by that graveside, I think to myself, what would he make of this city? And he's now in the heart of the financial district. What would he make of this? And I think most of the framers, including the Virginia crowd, would be appalled. I think they'd run back to Monticello and, uh, and hide. I think, I think Hamilton would be intrigued. I think he'd be amazed at the energy, the chaos, and the, just the size of it all. Uh, and I admire that too. So I like that about Hamilton. I like that Hamilton was a lawyer, not a you know, a thinker writing about Rousseau and Montesquieu all stroking his chin. He was a practicing lawyer uh, with clients and cases who stood up on his feet and argued. And I think that shows in the Federalist Papers and it shows in the concept of a government that he helped create and uh, institute. So I like that about him too. And I like his choice of heroes. I think if you asked Hamilton, the way I asked my jurors, who do you admire? Who's your hero? And I think without hesitation, he would say George Washington, a person who was in many ways just so much grander than everybody else of that era, and a person who was able to tap into Hamilton's genius and to harness it for this new nation. Uh, when I walk past that gravesite, I then get to the courthouse, and right next to my courthouse is the state courthouse. That's the law and order courthouse. You've all seen it, I'm sure. Dun, dun, right? it's, but over the, over the top, over the entrance, there's a quote, and many of you know it. Um, Anybody know it? Well, the true, this is what the quote is. It's a quote from Washington. The true administration of justice is the firmest pillar of good government. And that's taken from a letter, it's actually a misquote. It's really the due administration of justice, not the true, but I don't think it changes the meaning. But what, that's from a letter that Washington wrote to the first attorney general of the United States, Edmund Randolph, a fellow Virginian, a guy who went to William Mary, uh, and Mary. And, Washington was talking about the need to appoint men, and then it was only men, and a certain kind of man, uh, to the federal bench. You remember that the Articles of Confederation did not have federal courts, and so that was one of the great failures in the view of the folks who framed the Constitution. And so federal courts were recognized as important, and Washington recognized that as well. He recognized that for many people, their interaction with their government would be through the courts more than through the executive or the legislative branches. And it was vitally important that these courts be worthy of this mission. Uh, I think Washington would be very impressed with my colleagues on the bench, men and women today, who serve for the, in the federal judiciary, none more than Rena Raji, who I admire more than anybody. Really, it's true, sorry, don't blush. Who's here? No, it's the truth. Uh, she also grades my work, because. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
But, you know, I think it is true. I do think judges are important to the true administration of justice. But I don't think they are the only folks who are important, and I don't think they're the most important. I think law clerks are important. Many of you are going to be law clerks, and you're going to be part of this process. If the public knew what responsibilities you would have, they might be shocked. But, <laughs> but I think they'd also be impressed. Uh, and it's one of the great things about our branch is we don't really have this entrenched bureaucracy. We have law clerks who come in for a short period of time, who give it their best. They've got energy and vigor, and they then leave. And that's a good thing. There's a new infusion of talent every year or two, and that's a good thing. Jurors are part of the true administration of justice. I believe that the older I get. I see that they are wise, they know what they're doing, uh, and they are, as I said, the most democratic of institutions. But I think the greatest, the greatest pillar for the true administration of justice is lawyers. I really believe that. Everybody in this room either has or will eventually get sworn in to the bar of your state uh, and your federal bench. And when you do, you will take an oath. You'll take an oath to swear to, in which you will swear to uphold and defend, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And think about that. Lawyer, uh, I mean, teachers, Architects, accountants, bankers, they, they do very important work. But none of them really take an oath like that to support and defend the Constitution. That's your job. It will be your job to make sure that the constitutional values and rights and principles are preserved. It will be your job to make sure that the courts that you are admitted to are better than you found them. Uh, that's an enormous responsibility. Uh, and it's one that I think lawyers do take seriously. And there's no organization that takes it more seriously than the Federal Society. I really mean that. For 35 years or so, uh, they are committed to making sure that there is debate and discussion about the First Amendment and about so many other rights and legal issues. Uh, I don't think there's an orthodoxy here. I think there is, uh, other than a conviction, that getting the best and the smartest and the most articulate people on any issue on the same stage to give their best and strongest arguments will elevate the thinking and the results of legal discussion and debate. I think that is really admirable. I think your being here today demonstrates that. Uh, and it's your job also to then continue that when you go back home uh, in the communities where you work, at your schools uh, and in your, in your cities. So uh, this is a great honor. It's one that uh, I will certainly cherish forever. But I'm mostly really looking forward to being with you this weekend. So. Thanks for being here. Thank you to the folks at Columbia for this lovely gift and for sponsoring this great event. I hope I'll see you at the Low Library where we're headed next. I'll leave it over to, uh, to these guys to tell you where to go, but thanks so much.